Uh, my name is Ahmed Al Ganidi. I'm uh, an associate professor at uh, McGill School of Urban Studies and Planning. I've been working on um, public transit planning and operations uh, for several uh, years now, since 2011. Uh, no, 2001. I've been working on public transit planning and operations, generating different research. I had uh, I received my PhD from uh, Portland State University. And then I moved to University of Minnesota, where I had my postdoc for a couple of years, and I ended up at McGill in uh, Montreal, Canada, conducting uh, my research. So the work I'll be showing you today is an output of the work I've done with several students over the past uh, seven years. So uh, we'll see different ideas about what, what, how transit has been moving and how transit has been changing in the past, in Montreal, and I think this is a reflection is a, uh, is reflected in other parts of the world as well. Uh, please, if you feel if you have any question, you want to interrupt me. Uh, since this is a one-way communication, I'm not sure how can you do that except by sending me messages here, and uh, you type a message and you send it to me uh, on the right-hand corner with your questions if you have any. So, uh, getting started not working. So we are looking at the future. Uh, October 2015 is not too far away and uh, if some of you remember this movie Back to the Future where the cars were flying, they were flying in the future, that was supposed to be in October 2015. We're not there yet so I'm not sure, uh, but we still have a year to, to plan uh, ahead so we can have the flying cars. But the reality is we have something else that's going on. This is what we see now in uh, our transport system. We see uh, someone who wants to bicycle in Montreal in a bicycle lane that's like poorly cleaned from the snow. It's too cold to, to bike, but he's still doing it. Or you're taking the public transit and you're crammed in the, in the middle of the public transit system, it's too crowded. This is coming from uh, a picture that I took from a co on a commuter train uh, on the West Island going to the suburbs, com uh, coming from the suburbs of Montreal to downtown. So the reality is we have a heavily congested uh, public transit system. Uh, we are trying to promote uh, so the active transportation a little bit, but still we can't go too far because there are many things that are stopping us. Some, something like the weather is stopping us, for example, in Montreal a little bit, and we can't do a lot about it. Uh, while the, the challenges that are coming and uh, that are facing public transit uh, authorities are a lot because now we are starting to see new types of vehicles coming on the streets and I think in, a, in, in 15 years this will be the norm. These will be the new types of uh, vehicles that we'll see uh, on the streets. You'll see the self-driving cars that Google has taken a, a Piraeus and they adapted it and they, they added some kind of uh, some bells and whistles and then you find that the car is driving itself. So if a car is driving itself then you can see the, the fleet of cars and the, it's going to totally change. Some of the cars now are moving more to be electric. So the price of gas is not playing a big, won't be playing as big of a role of attracting new people to transit or forcing people to move to transit as it used to be in some times. Uh, times. Google is even going to the extreme. They are designing their own this kind of uh, fucking looking, funny looking car uh, that's up there. And this is a totally uh, automated, small, uh, at the size of a smart car that's going to be driving itself. So if, imagine you have uh, this kind of car in a, in, a, in a region. What's the future of transit? Where will transit fit with all these changes that's happening in the, in the market and that's happening on the types of cars? Yes, this is a, like a little bit of a long term, but we have to think about it a little bit as planners and not only think about the short term. So in order to understand the existing market and trying to increase the transit ridership, we have to put 
these ideas or these uh, phenomena in our mind that these are changes that's happened, dynamics that's happening, but we need to better understand the existing market. Who is using the, uh, the transit? Try to retain the riders and try to get more, uh, attract new users, people who can jump in and they can stay with us as much as possible. And retaining user can, can only happen through the satisfaction, increasing the level of satisfaction among uh, the transit users and increasing the loyalty of these users. So the people will be loyal to the system. They want to stay in it and they want to uh, keep working with the system. Previous research that I've done at the University of Minnesota, we uh, started looking at the transit market and we looked at the transit market and we started splitting it based on some uh, early work but, uh, by Ed Bamborn and um, uh, Nigel Wilson. They, uh, like Nigel started this in like 1984 and then Ed had his segmentation of the captive and choice users uh, at some point uh, in the early 2000s. And then we, we came up with this kind of figure that explained the, the, the transit market a little bit and where the change will be happening in the transit market. And what we found was that we found that we had captive transit users. These people don't have a choice. And the captive transit users are people who are stuck in the system. They are not going to leave the system. They are going to remain with you no matter what. And then you have the choice users. And these people are, it's, they are choosing to use transit. They have other options. They have other alternatives. And this is, these are mainly in the left-hand side are the existing transit market. The right-hand side, that was done through another survey. We analyzed another survey here on the right-hand side, which were non-transit non, uh, users. The non-transit users, we had auto-captives. Auto-captives, these were people when, we asked, when they were asked the question, would you uh, use transit? They answered, why don't you use transit? They answered, people like me don't use transit. So an auto-captive is the kind of guy that you don't want to be speaking with as a transit agency right now. He's not your potential customer that you, you can cater for, you can try and bring in to the system because he's captive to his auto, he's stuck to his, he wants to drive more and more and he, he thinks that people like him don't use transit. So how can we be attractive to this guy? There's the potential users who are not using transit but already using the cars and they want to jump in and use transit, but there is some kind of a barrier blocking them from there. So recently I started looking at only the left-hand side, where I'm looking at the captive and choice riders, because we felt that captive and choice riders only segmentation of the market and developing strategies that target captive and choice only is not the best way of looking at the market. There is also uh, the split here that we can see, which is between regular and irregular commuters. So a regular commuter is someone who commutes by transit every single day, going to work and coming back and doing the exact same uh, trip every day, while the irregular commuter, he has his own preferences. He would come and use transit once a week to go for shopping, to go for a recreational trip, to attend a concert, but then in the next day he will jump back and use uh, his call for other trips. So we have to understand that the dynamics of the market when we are dealing with a captive user who is a regular commuter is totally different from a captive user who is a regular commuter. The same happens with the choice. So that was the segmentation that we had and we were in general, I did this with uh, at the University of Minnesota with Kevin Kreisek, but we were unhappy with that. So this year I had a very smart student working with me, uh, Dea Van Lierup, and uh, through collaborations with the local transit authority here in Montreal, uh, the STM, and collaboration with uh, TransLink in uh, Vancouver, BC, in Canada, we uh, succeeded to get customer satisfaction data from uh, both agencies. And this gave us a unique opportunity to conduct an analysis that you can, you, you, you can rarely have, where you have, you're going to do segmentation, of two, of two transit authorities, and these two transit authorities, one of them is the STM and the other is TransLink. They are functioning in a totally different 
kind of systems, and we can understand the transit market and understand what's common between the two markets. So then we can think about the future of the transit and how can we develop strategies to retain these current users and to make sure that they are loyal to the system. So we did the exact same uh, factor cluster technique, but the interesting thing is that we had some new people who are using bus only in both uh, agencies. In Montreal, we have the metro, which is the subway uh, going under the ground, while in uh, it's a heavy rail going under the ground, like metro, metro system, subway system, similar that you can find in, in New York or in, uh, in some of the big cities around the world. But in, in, uh, they have the SkyTrain, which is a very nice, small, automated uh, vehicle uh, running uh, above ground, uh, elevated, uh, and they name it SkyTrains in, in Vancouver. Uh, and they are like a, a piece of art. If you go and use any of these SkyTrains uh, during the peak, you'll find that every uh, they go, like the, the headways goes down to a minute or even less than a minute. So every minute you can get a small sky, one of these sky trains coming and you jump in and then you get the, the one after. So waiting for the next sky train because the first one is full is not a big deal. And then you have people who are using both. So they're using a bus, then they switch to use a metro, or people who are using the bus, then using the sky train. So we use the technique that we are, the same technique we used in the previous study, which is named the factor cl cluster analysis. The factor cluster analysis is that we use a principal component uh, technique in, um, in statistics and this principal component techniques allows us to take uh, a series of uh, 30, 40 questions and summarize them into a uh, uh, small set of, uh, of variables or factors. So here we can see like the factors here in uh, the STM are like uh, overall satisfaction, uh, satisfied with safety, satisfied with cleanness, the frequency of users, all of that. And the same thing here, we can find with TransLink, we have the same kind of set of uh, clusters form. So we start with 40 or 50 questions, and then we take these 50 questions and we summarize them with the factor analysis to give us uh, a, a set of smaller variables. And these small variables, uh, we use their coefficients to generate the, cl uh, the clustering. Let's zoom in to uh, the bus, for example, so the bus clusters uh, in uh, Montreal. And the bus clusters in Montreal, we can see an there's something that's appearing that's not the regular captive and choice. There's something new that's coming out. It's the captive by choice. And the captive by choice, this is a person who's overall satisfied with uh, the transit system and uh, they are loyal to the transit system, they want to use it more, they're going to recommend it to others, and uh, they use it in the weekdays, they are generally affluent, and they don't own a car. So it is their choice not to own a car, and it's their choice to use transit. So they are captive to the system. If you categorize them, if we use the old captive and choice method, we can say that, oh yeah, you don't have a car, so you're a captive rider. Yeah, you don't have a car, you're a captive, but you, but you have the money to buy a car if you want. But you have chosen not to buy uh, a car, so this has gave us the new uh, kind of category that will explain more uh, down the road, which is the captive by choice. And this category represents a significant amount of people, and I'm going to show you that later on. And the other thing uh, that's very interesting is that we started to have this affluent weekend riders. So some people who, uh, who will go and ride the bus only in the weekend, they are well off, uh, they are satisfied with the system, they are a little bit loyal, not that much loyal, but they are using uh, this for go to go for a concert, to take their children for a, a small trip, in the weekend, so these are affluent weekend users. So the, we have to start see what kind of variety of systems we are offering to cater for these different segments of uh, the transit market. When we go back to the uh, taking all this information and we try to summarize it in 
two uh, figures, we find a little bit of similarities in the categories, but when we are talking about the bus users and metro users. So the captive by choice and the economizers, people who want to economize their travels, these are common between the bus and metro. There are people who are using bus and metro, and metro, the, these are the number of people who are common between all of them. The same thing we find when we categorize people in the uh, TransLink uh, side. But the most interesting part is that when you, after you categorize people on the TransLink side and the STM side, and the nice thing about this exercise is that we can take that and combine them together. See what kind of categories for people fall in in general. So we looked at the, the evolution of the captive and choice, and we had the captive by choice in the middle, where these are people who are captive by choice, and we can see that the majority of our riders, both from STM and TransLink, fall under the choice users. We find the majority of our users are choice users, uh, or the categories that we identified fall in the choice users on the weekday, while in the, uh, the captive by choice is present in both agencies, okay, and uh, the captive users in the weekdays, the regular and irregular, are still present in uh, both categories as well. So here we are seeing this kind of phenomena of also a new uh, weekend kind of uh, phenomenon. The, the differences that we found between the two transit agencies is very important because at TransLink survey, it's a phone survey, and it's much longer than the STM, and they ask more questions. So the more you ask questions, the more you collect data, the more you're allowed to understand your market better. And this is what we noticed when we compared the two agencies. The, the, we, we only found in the STM the, the weekend uh, choice users, the, and some of them are regular and some of them are irregular. But when we go to the STM, we found that there were many questions that were, that were not present in the, the STM survey. They were present in the TransLink, especially the weekend detailed questions about uh, why they are using the system at the weekend and the time of usage, the purpose, uh, things like that. These were in much more available and much more detailed in the TransLink, giving us the opportunity to dig deeper when you have a, a longer and more comprehensive survey, when you compare the two surveys to each other, when you're comparing the, the Montreal one to the Vancouver one. But the interesting part is that at the end of the day, we found that we can use data from two transit agencies to generate uh, uh, this kind of captivity by choice thing. And the numbers are very interesting. Well, if I look at the numbers, I found that my choice riders in uh, the regular choice rider, people who will commute every single day from point A to point B to go to work, from home to work, to work or from home to school uh, on a regular basis every day, I found that this represented around 50% of the STM and 32% of the TransLink. The captive by choice were not available in the TransLink in the regular commuter, but we find that the STM here, we are talking about 70% between choice and captive by choice. So these people, we have to make them happy. We have to work with them, see what's really affecting them in Montreal. These are 70% of the population that we are talking uh, about. When you start adding the irregular commuters, okay, you'll find that your numbers of choice and captive by choice are going way high. You're almost reaching 80% of your population uh, in, uh, in Montreal. You're reaching 60% of the population in uh, Vancouver. So we are talking about between 80 to 60% of the users of, a transit, of the transit market in Canada are coming mainly from people, it's their choice to use transit. They can afford and they can take something else, but they are choosing to use transit. So if the transit system, something wrong happens with it, or this uh, transit system breaks, you're, you're, the probability of using part of these 70% is huge. The, captive, the captives, the people, your secured market, that, you, that no matter what's going to happen, they're going to come and use your system, you're talking about nine, like 10%, between 3 and 10% here 
in, uh, if you compare the Vancouver data to uh, the Montreal data. So here we succeeded to get from uh, the regular of captive and captive by choice kind of design to a new uh, diagram where I have a captive users and a captive by choice and a choice users and we have the same regular and irregular commuting kind of patterns. This kind of, the, of, of split that we can see in here, we can take that a little bit further and we dig deep about what's really affecting uh, each type of these, like what's really affecting the captive and the captive by choice and the choice users to understand it. And one of the things we started to find that it's a new market. It's a brand new market that we haven't dealt with before as, tra as transit planners. And I think transit agencies also found that it's a brand new market. This brand new market is young and they're attached to their uh, cell phones more than they're attached to their uh, mother or father. They, they, can, they are linked to them, they can't leave the, the, the thing. So if you look at this picture, you find that the girl crossing the street, she's not even looking what's happening around her, she's just holding the, her uh, uh, cell phone and just reading and not looking around. While if you look at these three guys uh, on the bikes waiting to cross, the first one is holding the his iPhone in his hand or his cell phone in his hand, while the other two, each one of them has something in his ears, so they're even listening to music while they are cycling and going around. So it's a totally different kind of phenomena or, or, uh, that we're talking with and different kinds of people that we're dealing with here. And uh, it's different dynamics. How can we deal with that? And how can we make sure that we are satisfying this, these new users uh, with the system. We are seeing new needs, new needs like some people, everybody now from all these cyclists, they want to take their bike on the, on the train. How can they take their bikes on the train? Also the same thing happens with uh, this guy wants to go to play hockey uh, after uh, his thing, so he's, more, he's going around with all this big huge bag uh, to work in the AM commute in Montreal and, and, well, the, and you see the snow over there. So you have a lot of different needs and new needs that's showing up uh, that was not present in the past. You're not talking about uh, a captive user who doesn't have a choice, who just wants to go out shopping with three bags. No, you have someone who wants to do sports with the tra use the transit to go to sports. He wants to use transit to go for recreation and uh, events, uh, things like that. So one of the things we looked at um, these captive and choice and what's really affecting them. And we identified uh, three main themes that are affecting the existing users in both Vancouver and uh, Montreal. And I think it will be the same in uh, many parts around the world. We're talking about the low cost of transit. Low cost of transit plays a big role in how people are, uh, like I'm using transit because it is much cheaper. If I find an alternative, for example, uh, parking on the down, in the downtown went cheap because you have automated cars, so I don't have to park anymore. So it's only be costing me the cost of the gas. Oh, but now it's electric car, so I can take the, uh, my electric car, it's automated, so I don't have to park, I don't have to drive, so my travel is convenient, so I won't be using transit anymore, I will quit using transit. So transit has to remain as a low cost, uh, an alternative to make sure that it can take people from point A to point B a little bit faster than the car to be competitive, it has to be convenient. And we have to keep improving the system and show the customers or the transit customers that we are trying to improve the system because if we don't show that there will be a, a decline of number of users and people will be quitting using transit because people are really sensitive to changes or improvements and they are always asking for something new to happen. Looking at some trends from Montreal uh, can, can give us some little bit insights about what's happening, what's happening with this new generation of uh, transit users. We, in Montreal we conduct uh, 
every five years uh, an origin destination survey by the Agence Metropolitan de Transport, it's the uh, local authority, uh, overlooking all the transit agencies, and they do this only survey. They survey 5% uh, of the population of Montreal every uh, five years. Uh, and then they, they did that in uh, 1998, they did it 2003, 2008. They did another one in 2013, it's not out yet, but what we found in that, that the age group, people who are 20 to 24 the, uh, years old, represented only 14% uh, of all the people who are taking transit, while on the other hand, this number remained the same in 2003, but it went down in 2008. This means that the number of young and youth that we are attracting to get into the system is going down, it's not going high. And you find that this trend is going between people who are 25 to 29 years old, 30 to 34, 35 to 39, while the number of old people, older people, people my age and things like that, these are guys who are coming and jumping in uh, more. So you find an increase in the number of people who are, the percentage of, of users who are a little bit older. And this made us to try to think why this is happening, what's going on in there. And I had a, a student, his name is Michael Grimsrud, and he's very smart. He started doing, trying to analyze this phenomena of understanding uh, how this trip, uh, why these trips are changing, and why these counts are changing over time, and how can we uh, account for that. Because in general, what we uh, we find that, that like in, in, in terms of mode split for, for our AM peak in Montreal, we will go, it's going up, we're going up in, in terms of the total percentage of total mode share, we're going up, we reached 24% in, in 2008, we were at 19, we went to 24, that's a big change for transit to see this kind of dramatical increase in the number of people uh, using transit or the, the percentages. The same thing happened in the automobile, it's going in the, in the, in the opposite direction. So making the li we have a lot of construction, so making the life of drivers a little bit harder led to some kind of things. We had a little bit of uh, price changes in, in gas that might have affected that at that time, but still we, we we looked at it very closely with different statistical models. We couldn't relate that to this kind of phenomena on its own. But the interesting thing, the most interesting thing about uh, studying these cohorts and studying uh, people over time is what is the figure that uh, Mike had generated in here that I've been like uh, using and he named it uh, falling up and staying high. Uh, this figure. Because this figure, he takes data from three uh, OD surveys, 2008, uh, 1998, 2003, 1998, and he combines all of that together and by age group and by cohort, and he starts displaying it to understand how is the transit uh, market changing and the mode share changing. And what we, he finds is the following. Among the young populations, if we look here to the left-hand side, in this part, this uh, pink side, uh, part, he finds that people are, uh, here are very, they start high. So it means that the number of uh, the mode share among the young themselves, if you're talking only the young themselves, we're not, not talking about everybody else, only the young people, when they start, they start a little bit higher. And then as they age here, in, uh, they become 30 years old, they lose, uh, in, in the, we lose them in the market, and then we lose them more in the market. So, explaining this figure slowly again, this dotted line represents one of the OD surveys, the 2008, while this other one represents the 2003, and this one represents uh, the 1998. So if a person was uh, 20 years old in 1998, this is how much, how much they were using transit. They were using transit at 35% in 1998. When these guys became older, they became 
between 25 and 30, we find them that their usage dropped in the 2003 survey. And then it dropped again in the 2008 survey. So that's why we see this kind of, of a decline in the trend. This decline, and then you have a little bit of a plateau kind of area here. So what's happening is, if this means that people are using transit when they're young. And then when they move to different stages in life, they stop using transit. And when they stop using transit, this means that they will gonna do, go to the plateau. Some of them will remain in the system. So we will never, we don't go to the, to the zero percent because we still have some choices and captive by choice and captives. So these guys here, when they move to the 30 years old, when they have a family, they move to the suburbs, they, uh, they have to drive their kids, so not all of them are using transit anymore. But we see that the interesting part is that if you start high, you're going to drop, but you're going to plateau at a higher level. That's the key. If you start, the higher you start here uh, for these guys, these were the guys born, born the youngest generation born, uh, you can name them Generation Y which is born 1979 to 1983. They fall more and most in the generation one. They start here. When they start that high, they drop. See, they are dropping here. They are dropping much higher than the previous generation, the previous cohort. It, in other words, this means that if you start high, you're going to plateau, but at a higher level when you get older. means that you can get more penetration or more loyalty in uh, among the young generations only if you start at a high uh, level up there. So this is a, a major phenomenon that we noticed here in, uh, in Montreal. We are now waiting for the new uh, OD survey to come out uh, in 2013 to uh, validate our findings. One of the things we validated these findings through um, a statistical model uh, and our statistical model was uh, very interesting because we, we succeeded to control for changes in, uh, in, in the infrastructure, uh, things like that and these allowed us to even see how things are going and how things are moving when we are moving here. So we started, so if you start high when you're young, yes we're going to lose some of these uh, people but they're going to plateau at a higher level and we remain. So policies affecting the younger generation to bring them in, to understand these guys with, uh, with uh, attached to their phones more than to their parents is very important to understand. Because the system now in Montreal and in many parts around the world, you have a very long waiting time, times, totally crowded buses and in, in many cases, in systems like Montreal, when it's an old system, you get lots of breakdowns. So these things we have to deal with. We have to work on increasing the speed of the transit system, making it as fast, decrease the delays, try to be on time and try to be cool. Try to show the, that we are trendy with the young, trying to attract the young. The more you attract the young, the more you'll get choice riders and captive by choices in the future. The captive by choice are generally young populations. They are not old people. So I would try as much as possible to attract the young population and keep them on board. And improvement and investments from the transit agency have shown to be, in our previous research, to be effective. And this is what I'll, I'll be talking about in, in, in the next thing. Because one of the things that the transit agency concentrates mainly on uh, on-time performance, for example. And when they concentrate on on-time performance, you see that there's always the perception of waiting time and the perceptions of the left-hand side of the passengers. And their perceptions change over time. And what's happening is that when you improve the transit agency's improvers a little bit of its on-time performance, the perception of satisfaction scale goes way higher than the amount of improvement that happened. So a very small change or an improvement from the transit agency is expected to have a big or huge impact on the perception and satisfaction, uh, the perception of waiting time and satisfaction. And this was found in a, in a literature review study I, we did uh, last year with Ihab and um, one of the students Ihab. 
we looked at, at um, improvements and in in little bit of details in Montreal. And when looking at these improvements in details, I can tell you uh, we had a, a, a very interesting case study. Uh, STM asked us they wanted to implement an express service parallel to a regular service. And they asked us, can you please help us design this new service along Route 67. Route 67, Montreal is an island. This is downtown area. And this is the route here, running Route 67. They had around 41,000 users uh, per uh, weekday in 2011. So we wanted uh, to generate a, a bus route running parallel to this one. And what kind of bus route should we do? It wanted an express. So we started designing for them the new express route. So we went through uh, a very, very interesting exercise. We started with them uh, at the time when I started my job here in Montreal, uh, designing the express route. And then they took the design and implemented it, which was an amazing thing for me that our work is being implemented in the world. And then they went to that, let's do an exclusive busway, give it like a BRT kind of a sense that the bus can run during the AM peak on its own uh, right of way. And let's give them more articulated buses and let's have signal priority. So this happened between all these improvements in 2009 and 2010. So we had uh, bus data between these periods and before that and after so we can uh, evaluate the bus performance uh, during that time. The most interesting part is that we estimated for them when we designed the system that they will have a range, uh, uh, a realistic improvement of 19%. They ended up saving 13.7% compared to what, so we told them you're supposed to be saving between uh, 11 and 19. Of course, the optimistic was too optimistic when we were doing the design. So it's 11 to 19. That's the, the reali reality that we can get. So they ended up saving 14. They're in the middle uh, of what we estimated for them for Route 467 and uh, for Route 67. And we found that the main reasons that happened is that articulated buses, when they implemented, they were very slow, much slower than the regular buses and they had a smart card implementation that delayed things a little bit. But the most interesting thing that happened is that we looked at the initial situation and how much improvement uh, we faced and we found that every single route at the end we see like transit signal priorities we, we are uh, savings 9% when you implement signal priority and you're saving 11% of the of your running time in one direction see this is like split by direction and by AM peak and PM peak and the same thing happening in in the route 67 so route 67 had the mixed effect had some positives some negatives uh, here it's all negatives means mean, negative means I'm saving time I'm saving 10% of my running time compared to the initial situation so I had a very good student, he had Diab, and he said, said let's, let's survey people over time, over a three-year period, and see how they are seeing the service and seeing the improvements of the service. And one of the things he did this survey in 2011, 2012, 13. So it's after all these uh, improvements have taken place. And when he did the survey, the most interesting thing is that, and we saw how much the time savings has happened. So, Route 67, uh, the majority of the people said it's shorter travel time. 55% said shorter travel time. If you remember a couple of slides earlier, no, it wasn't 55, it wasn't shorter. It's almost the same. The change didn't, it didn't change that much. 10% said it's longer. You can't do anything about these 10%. Their, their perception is totally off. I'm not sure why they said it's longer. Uh, but 35% said they didn't feel a change. On the, compared to the time when they started using the service. While for 467, uh, the improvements has been 49% felt they are having shorter travel time and 44% felt there's no change in the service compared to when they started. Although there has been a lot of changes that STM implemented. They implemented the exclusive bus service, the, the uh, signal priority. So we're talking about 15, 20% improvement in running time on the 467. Not on the 67, but the 467 have seen improvements and people, some people are seeing these, these but not everybody's feeling the improvements that we talked about. 
The most interesting part is that we did the surveys over time. We did it in uh, 2010, 11, and 12. And we asked people, how much time savings do you think you had? And, uh, and we, we predicted this is the upper bound and the lower bound. So this gives me a range of how people are thinking about the savings, this two lines. And this is the actual number here, how much they are actually saving compared to their actual trip. Because we know, we ask people where they get on, where they get off, and then we get the, the bus data in average to see how much was the savings before and after. The interesting part is that people overestimated their, their savings by around three to four minutes, three to four, like three to five minutes here, almost. And then by time, this estimation went down. So at, at the first when you implement an improvement, people overestimate the, 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 the savings. And then the longer they stay using the system, the lower the estimation goes down. Okay, and they try to reach the reality exactly where they are, but they are still overestimating. They are still overestimating the savings that uh, took place. So, in order to wrap up the the, the talk and the take home lessons, uh, so as not uh, to keep you longer, is we want to keep younger generation on board. We'll try to attract them more of them and make them happy. The more you attract younger generations, the better they are going to stay because these are my choice riders and my captive by choice. And because when they move from being captive that they don't have a driver license, I want to make sure that they will jump to be uh, a captive by choice or a choice. I don't want them to be in the auto captives telling me people like me don't ride transit. So I have to try to attract these guys. I have to make them more happy. I give them free Wi-Fi on the, uh, this because they want to play with their colleagues and their games, they don't want to use their uh, data time. Uh, many of them are uh, cycling avids, uh, uh, they, they, they want to use bicycles and they want to do multi-modality, so make sure that you have this integration of the multi-modality, okay, and better information. One of the major things we found was the better information, so if you have a breakdown and you provide good information, it's more acceptable than when you leave them in the snow and waiting and you don't tell them because many people will lose the, you lose them in the, in the system. Implementing the improvement in phases can help in, in giving you a long-term uh, satisfaction with, uh, with the people. And usually based on the way the funding comes uh, to many transit engines, implementing things on phases can be also a, a good idea. A long-term future, going back to the Google car, uh, I think the future of the public transit will be along uh, heavy corridors where we can uh, com move uh, thousands of people per hour in, from one point to another. Uh, but this has to be done quickly at a low cost and a comfortable and attractive vehicles. If we don't do that, then the, we will lose this market to the private auto again, because the private auto is becoming more and more attractive and we won't be solving our uh, urban problems uh, as we wish we would be. So last, I'd like to uh, acknowledge uh, the three students who have done most of the work I have shown you uh, over the past uh, six or seven years with me. Ihab Diab, he's a PhD student at McGill and he's currently finishing in the job market. Michael Grimswood, he's currently a planner at, uh, in, Van uh, in Vancouver, BC. And Dave and Leo, she's currently a PhD student uh, working with me. Also, this work that you have seen has been funded by different agencies, and uh, we can uh, have to acknowledge that. And there were many, many, many students who went on the streets to collect the survey data that you have seen. So I have to acknowledge these guys, as well as uh, STM and uh, TransLink for giving me the data that I have used in here. So uh, this is my email if you have any questions. Also please we can hang out a little bit if you want to ask any more questions. You can just text the questions or uh, okay. It seems that I missed many of the questions. Some people asked questions and I didn't see them. I'm sorry. Let me go back. 
let me go back slowly. Hi, what is the y-axis on the graph? Uh, I can't see. This panel thing is so hard to see. Uh, the graph I think you're talking about was the one with the minutes. Uh, if you're talking about this one, this is percentage of people of more choice, and that was the only graph I had. The other graph I had was the one with uh, here, the, these were minutes. So if you're asking about this one, these were minutes. Could you please repeat the difference between captive by choice and captives? Okay. Captive by choice and captive. If I'm talking about a captive by choice and, ca and, and captive, what are the differences? A captive by choice is someone who has, who can afford to buy a car, but he chooses not to buy a car. And this person who chooses not to buy a car, so now he doesn't have, he, he's, he doesn't have a lot of alternatives except to use transit. But if he wants, he can go down tomorrow morning and buy a car. So that's a captive by choice. It's his choice not to, to be part of the captivity section. If you are talking about a choice person, a choice is like, I have a car parked down there. I will go out and use my car and uh, uh, right away. So I can go and use the car right now and go to my work. But I have chosen not to use my car today and jump in uh, the train and go to work. So this means that I am a choice user because I have an alternative. A captive by choice, he doesn't have an alternative right now, but he can have an alternative if he wants, but he chooses not to have this alternative. So this is the explanation of a captive by choice. My transmission is very bad local problems. I can't do anything about that. One of the files ones, one of the first ones. Okay, I found, a, I found the one that you were talking about, Rob, I think. Any other questions? Omar, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, thank you, Ahmed. I can hear you very well. Uh, so let's uh, give yes, another opportunity, a few okay. seconds, a few, maybe one or two minutes, so if there's any question. Let me read. There's another question. This is Omar saying something. Is it possible to include O2 users in the study like this? I mean with the objective and identifying features that could be important for people willing to switch from O2 to transit systems. Yes, we did a study. Uh, we had a, a, the study in Minnesota. If you go back, if you go back to the study in Minnesota, we had, uh, let me go back, we had this one. We, we, these were, we were analyzing two surveys. The first survey was a survey by, uh, done by the transit agency. The right one was people who don't use cars. So we, yes, we reached the potential users and auto captives by analyzing non-auto, uh, like non-transit users and understanding who's a potential and who's a captive. So yes, we can use the same technique for, but here in, in the, Second studies that I showed you after that one were identified the choice and captive by choice. We were concentrating mainly on uh, the, cap the, the, the transit agencies and, and the, their characteristics. I can't see. It's very hard to see the questions. I'm sorry. It's like the panel is so hard to see. Okay, let me go back here. One of the first one. Do you think the findings of your research affect appropriate level of subsidy or funding eligible to transit system? I hope so. <laughs> uh, I hope so. I'm not sure. But I think uh, it should affect the, 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 the findings of our research says that you have to target the younger population. To target the younger population, you have to subsidize the transit to make it affordable for them more. If you are not making it affordable, then you, you, you're going to vanish. As public transit agencies, they're going to vanish. We won't be able to compete in the market and we won't be able to stay active in this uh, uh, market. How do you think your study can be applicable in an environment where there's no much transport choices like development uh, cities? 
if you are talking about the developing countries, in, in, in developing countries, the, the, many of the problems is that people are switching to cars. They want the American dream as much as possible, and they want to own their cars. And the public transit system that's provided is generally not good, not so good. So working on improving the public transit system, making it reliable, fast, and cool, and to attract more uh, users, I think is the way to go. Uh, for the future for developing countries as well. So, uh, uh, like the BRTs that's going on in Latin America, this is an example of how you can provide good, reliable, fast service in a developing country that uh, is, uh, is good. So, and you can attract both the captives and the, and the captive by choice and the choice and get more of the choice and captive by choice and move people more to be captive by choice as much as you can because you don't want, if everybody wants to own a vehicle, owns a vehicle, you will be facing, uh, will be facing some big urban problems in the future, I think.